I'm Kimberly. Welcome back to Cross Stitch University. This is the last video in our series and I'm gonna take all of the questions that we got and answer them today. So let's start with question number one. The first question asks, if you can only buy one Q-snap, what is the best size since we recommend the eight inch Q-snap for the series? We recommend the eight inch because it fits the design perfectly. But if you could only buy one Q-snap, I would actually recommend the 11 inch square so that if you have a bigger piece, it will fit that also. Our second question is asking about needle size. We recommended a size 26 for this project and our customer would like to know when would you use a size 24 or a 28. So I would recommend using a size 24 needle with 10 count or 11 count fabric. I would recommend a size 26 with 14 count, 16 count, 25 count, and 28 count. I would recommend size 28 on your higher count, like 18 count, 36 count, and 40 count. Your size 24 needle is gonna be your fattest and your longest. Your size 28 is gonna be your shortest and your skinniest. So you can see the eye of the needle on the size 24 is much, much bigger than your 28. So your size 28 is gonna be harder to thread, but you need it to be super small when you're working with smaller fabrics. The third question asks if the Danish method and the English method use the same amount of floss or does one method use more? We think they use about the same amount of floss. Our fourth question asks if we have any hints about counting stitches in a large number. So when I'm stitching, I will just stitch and count as I go. Some people use a counting pen. So if you wanted to go ahead and count, you could put a needle and leave that as a marker, or you can just count as you go. I find that just counting as I go is just as easy as using a counting pen. Our next question asks about moving the needle up and down and placement. So I'm actually gonna show you how to stitch from bottom to top, and then from top to bottom, and then from left to right, and then right to left. And I'm just showing you the way I do it. This is not set in stone, you can do it any way you want. So when I'm traveling up, I start in the bottom left and go in the top right. Pull my thread through the loop. Bottom right to top left. Now if I go back in the top left, that's where I just was. So my stitch will come out. So you can't stitch there. So now what I do is I go top right bottom left, bottom right, top left. And then I just keep going. Now there's not a right or wrong way. This is just the Kimberly way. So that is how I go from bottom to top. When I'm going top to bottom, I do all of my X's the same way because when I go down, I'm not going in a previously used hole. So this way, I just do bottom left, top right, bottom right, top left. And I think my stitches all lay about the same, even though it is slightly different. In the end, you get the same result. If you're going to do rows, I would do the row all the way to the side, and then go back. That's what I would normally do. So if you wanna do one stitch at a time, I would do bottom left to top right, bottom right to top left, and then I would just keep doing the same thing. You're not messing with previously used stitches where your thread will come out. So you don't have to change that first stitch. Now, if I was going from right to left, you could do this, 
which I would rarely do because it would be kind of awkward, but you could do this and then come back or what would be easier to do would be one stitch at a time if you're going right to left. And that's just because of the ease of the way my hand moves and my preference as a right-hander. So that's just a couple of ways that you can move your thread when you're stitching. Our sixth question is asking, how do you do a confetti stitch when you're using one strand of floss and you cannot do the loop method? So that would normally be on an 18 count or a smaller count, but I'm just gonna demonstrate on the count I have right here, and we're gonna be using one thread, and we're gonna do one confetti stitch. So I will just do my first part of my stitch on the back, go over the previous stitch, and you've stitched over that, and then do one more stitch. And then what I would do is I would just pull this under, pull it tight, because that's gonna pull everything else tight, and then just anchor this under a couple of times. And that's going to, when you anchor that, it's gonna anchor that first stitch, and then I would just clip. And then I would just mess with your stitch and make sure it doesn't come out. Our seventh question is asking about pin stitches. She said, some people have shown doing a pin stitch when ending confetti stitches. I tried doing them, but I don't think they're very secure. What do I think about pin stitches? I've tried pin stitches a couple of times and I've just found that I don't like them. So I don't use those in my stitching. Our next question is asking about colonial knots and French knots. And they're asking when you should use a colonial knot versus a French knot. And I think that is a personal decision. I think that you can interchange those. To me, they kind of mean the same thing. I think it's a personal preference and whichever one that you do that looks best is what I would use. Our ninth question asks, what do you do when you're finished and you realize you missed a cross? Is there a way to fix it without ripping out the entire border? So I would say, if you cross twice on accident, instead of on one stitch, if you crossed over two, I would just clip that out. I would pull out about five stitches this way, five stitches this way, and secure them under and then restitch. Or if you've just missed a stitch, you can just make that stitch and tack it under. Now that is something that's gonna take time to master and you'll kind of get the hang of it once you've made enough mistakes. Our 10th question, our viewer would like for us to show pictures of the front of our piece and the back of the piece. She caught a glimpse of the back and she traveled more than I did. She's also unsure of how to stitch moving around the designs and seeing your back will help me see how you did it. So here's a picture of our back and just remember, everyone stitches differently and some people travel more than others. And the most important thing is, just travel as long as you can't see it on the front. Someone has asked for us to demonstrate how to press the fabric and talk about temperature, steam, pressing, and all those things. So I found a piece that hasn't been pressed yet that's finished, and I'm just gonna show you how I iron. The first thing I'm going to do is I do have steam on, and I have it on the cotton setting, and I'm going to first start by pressing around the stitches. There's two different ways you can do this. You can place this face down on a clean ironing surface and just press. I do use steam or you can use the yarn tree pressing cloth. It's like a piece of foam and it's very thick and you can press into the foam and that will help your stitches stay nice and flat. Now, if I needed this crease to come out, I'm gonna take some starch, just put it on there. I'm gonna let it dry a little bit. I'm gonna make sure it doesn't touch any of my threads and I'm gonna set my iron right on it for about 10 seconds. And when it dries, it will be perfectly fine and that crease will be gone. Our last question is asking about taking a piece to the framer. What does she need to ask for beforehand and what does she need to know when she gets there? 
So what I would say is first, before you go to the framer, have your piece ironed and pressed. Remove all of your wrinkles. When you get to the framer, you will decide if you want glass on the top or not. And when you're picking glass, you can either pick museum quality, which should not fade your fabric or your floss, or you can just pick regular glass. And you can decide that based on where you're gonna display your piece in your home. You will also want to tell them how much space you would like between the edge of your design and the frame showing. And I usually do a quarter inch to a half inch. It depends on the design. You can also ask them to put spacers in if you want a slight bit of space between your piece and your glass. And that would be needed if you have beads or buttons on your piece. And that's a wrap for Cross Stitch University. But remember, you can still ask questions and make sure to click the bell to be notified when we have new videos. See you next time.